Hello and welcome. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You've probably had the experience that I've found the last few days from time to time when suddenly the same perception seems to be coming at you through a number of different sources and after a while you stop and you say, I wonder, wonder if I'm supposed to take notice of this. Um, and in my case, it's been a question of the objective existence of evil as being the element that changes the nature of a conversation or a personal encounter or even of one's understanding of, of world history. Um, let me begin for a moment with a, with a, a critic of mine who's written to me saying uh, how grateful he was for a man called Richard Raw, who is a Franciscan. Um, this man's not a Catholic, but uh, Richard Raw allowed him to regain his faith. And in particular, this man's also a great admirer of Pope Francis and wanted to write to me to tell me what damage he thought I was doing to the faith by criticising the value system that Pope Francis is pursuing. I was talking to uh, to, to somebody who's been through, a, another person who's been through a great, great crisis of faith. And as we were looking at, at the differences between the way in which we assessed what was important in the church and for the soul, and the gap between us was quite large. Again, he, he made a comment saying, I'm really not sure if I accept the existence of objective evil. And then the third thing is the dreadful, the completely and utterly dreadful events uh, in Gaza and Palestine. Let me begin with Gaza and Palestine because um, I think that's probably the most pressing and the most obvious place to begin. I was listening to an American journalist called Barry Weiss. She's, she's Jewish. She's uh, been suffered cancellation for not accepting the, um, the requirements to believe in the imagination when it is at odds with the biology. I'm not going to use all the obvious language because that way you invite censorship. But if I tell you that we have a particular present, a pressing current problem in terms of the way in which uh, some men in particular understand uh, their gender as being different in their head than in their biology, you'll know what Barry Weiss was talking about. But she's a liberal Jew and she was invited on to trigonometry talking to Constantine Kassin and his friend. And one of the very interesting things she said was that people, I, I've been a liberal, I've been a progressive, I wanted justice, I thought that perhaps we could offer land for peace. And one of the things I've been overwhelmed by is the hatred. Not only the hatred of the Palestinians and of Hamas, but the hatred, and not only the hatred of Islam, but the hatred of people who came out into the streets to shout gas the Jews, the hatred of the people who within hours of babies being burnt and perhaps beheaded and grannies being kidnapped came out to celebrate this as a good thing. And it seemed and she was was very taken aback at the difficulty that any sense of the absence of evil presents you with when dealing with these kind of moral clashes. I've been writing about Islam in the Catholic Herald recently and delicately and <laughs> hesitantly I've been trying to talk about the problem that we find in Islam over the lack of forgiveness and and the way in which when hate gets going there isn't any authority within the Quran that we can refer to in order to deal with the hate and turn it into forgiveness. And so, for example, you may be aware that if you blaspheme against Muhammad, particularly in places like India, there's a great danger that you may be executed. There is no forgiveness in Islam when it comes to certain principles to do with, with power and jihad and, as seen through Islamic eyes, justice. Of course, the same thing is true in wokery. There is no forgiveness there either. You can't be forgiven thought crimes. A tweet 20 years ago will destroy your career. It doesn't matter how much you apologise. And so here we have two belief systems in which hate and the lack of forgiveness uh, mars them and characterises them. But in the case of Israel and Gaza, setting aside for the moment the whole tortuous argument of whose claim to the land is better, everything depends upon the presuppositions you start with. If you start with a presupposition that the, that the Arabs were there in force 
uh, and uh, the Jews had left and gone and it was the Arabs country then you, you were more sympathetic to the Palestinian cause uh, particularly if you pursue decolonization as it has been expressed in the academy recently and if you take the view that God entered into a covenant with Israel they're called Jews because they came from Judea their passport is their nationality and their geography uh, and that they have wanted to make a two-state state solution that allows two communities to live in peace, uh, then you'll take more sympathetic to the Jewish point of view. But what's been extraordinary is the way in which Islamic activists have hated the Jews sufficiently to want to hide behind their own people and allow them to become casualties in pursuit of justice. And Barry Weiss was saying that the only way really of understanding this outpouring of hate against the Jews amongst progressives, not only in Hamas, but around the world, was that they had been captured by evil. For what else is it to rejoice in the death of babies and grandmothers and the gratuitous massacre and murder of unarmed civilians? Of course, people can find a reason for changing their category. But, but what else is that but evil? It's been very interesting to hear people who were soft progressive talk about the need to recognise the reality of evil if only to deal with what they're encountering, to, to deal with the wholesale murder of human beings. And it was said quite rightly, I think, that even the Germans, the Gestapo, realised there was something morally wrong about murdering the Jews, which is why they did it out of sight and tried to cover their tracks. But Hamas sees nothing wrong emerging the Jews and does it in broad daylight, which appears to be a further step in degradation and in expressing the extent to which evil has a grip on the human heart. Rather more mundanely, <clears throat> um, one, of my, one of my critics who wrote to me uh, upbraided me for my being critical of Pope Francis. He said that he was not Catholic, but he'd been very much helped by a man called Richard Raw, who's a Franciscan who, who writes inclusive semi-mystical books and that he now was able to believe again and he thought Pope Francis was a good man and I was not a good man for criticising him and indeed I ran the risk of destroying the faith. Uh, and I wondered how I could explain to this correspondent the difference between the kind of Christianity that I'm pursuing and the kind that he and Pope Francis, bless him, are pursuing and an analogy came to me which i found quite helpful you might <laughs> it may prove inadequate but who knows but i thought imagine that we're talking about football and um, you have two two modes of football they both contain so much similarity both a team of 11 people playing on a pitch with a goal and um, but in one there is no opposition so one is a kind of exhibition or demonstration football and you can have 12, 11 people knocking the ball around with some sophistication uh, and um, shooting at goal with some skill, finding the corner post with a kind of slice of the ball that curves in. You can, you, you can show great beauty and great skill and something really quite interesting, but it's very different from a game in which there is an opposition where you play the opposition. In fact, the first model, they don't see an opposition. There just isn't one. That's not what the game is about but in the second one it's about overcoming an opposition and it seems to me that these are the two versions of Christianity because there is a view of Christianity in which which Richard Raw takes and I think the Pope too where where evil is not recognized as an objective reality and one of the ways in which that becomes clear is with a lack of concern for holiness or a changing of the definition of holiness, which is another way of doing it. But if you look at the first covenant, the Old Testament, we can see that it's a it's a it's a one thousand year training in holiness, in discrimination, in discernment, in distinction between between holy and unholy, between sacred and profane, even to the extent of using different cooking vessels, not just as a matter of hygiene, but also a matter of, of carrying out this this division between good and bad, holy and unholy, into almost everything that one does. And if you go, for example, to one of those great moments when, when Theophanes happened, Encounters with God, 
take for example Elijah in, in uh, sorry, is Isaiah in Isaiah six. Then they, when in with a vision of God, the first thing Isaiah says is, "Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst a people of unclean lips." And he had this great sense of needing to be purged. And indeed, an angel came with a burning coal and purged his lips, either metaphorically or literally, we don't know. But this sense of being in the presence of God and the gap between his holiness and our unholiness is what, what marks and describes, expresses the heart of the relationship between God and what we might call fallen humanity. I've known what it is to uh, to take a different view of holiness, um, and it's partly because I found evil too difficult to cope with. In the early days of my Christianity, when I entered through an evangelical Protestant gate, my first two or three years were marked with some very real encounters with the devil who tried to stop me doing certain things, including being ordained. Uh, including giving, talking about Jesus in public. And these demonic encounters were absolutely terrifying. But of course, they also had the effect of making me, be, strengthening my belief that what I was doing was real. I was, I was struggling with and for God against an enemy. As I grew more sophisticated, I gave up some of this clarity because I, though I was, um, I, I was quite close to some some mental illness, and it became increasingly difficult to tell the difference between mental illness and objective evil. There is a very very problematic overlap in that. One of the things that happens in your encounter with objective evil is that you you hear voices or you gain a strong impression that there is no hope and that it's all your fault. And this hopelessness and sense of accusation uh, are enormously debilitating and they exist as symptoms of the spiritual struggle when you're being demonized, but they also exist, of course, as symptoms of mental illness. And it can be quite difficult to untangle the two. You can be mentally ill without being got at by the devil and you can be got at by the devil without being mentally ill. And sometimes in very complex cases, the as a problematic overlap, but in my case, I, I, I ran out of courage, patience, wisdom, experience, and I partly fell in love with Carl Gustav Jung because uh, he, his whole doctrine of the shadow allowed me to confront evil and see it as a form of fear of those unrealized and unaccepted aspects of oneself. Well, that's not untrue. There's quite a lot of truth in Jung, of course. But to say, but, but to say that that, is, that that encompasses the whole of our struggle with evil, it's about subjective self-realization or the lack of it, uh, is to move you somewhere very different in the spiritual struggle. And one of the things that I've begun to be more aware of is that at least two different forms of Christianity, one where there's a great sense of the holiness of God and that the reality of evil is, is there, intends to pervert holiness, is that often sex and gender become the arena in which these things are played out. And people who promote, let's say, the inclusive version of sexuality in order to try and avoid some censorship in the, on YouTube, people who promote the inclusiveness don't understand that those who are orthodox and conservative are partly responding to what they see as a perversion of sexuality because it is so offensive to God. It, it causes repulsion to God. It's just not a matter of a projection of fa human fastidious or human neurosis. But this is a sense that what God has called us to is a, is a purging of our own appetites and, uh, and a moving away from the flesh into the arena of the soul, a shifting of our, our weight and our appetite and our longing. And instead, of course, the secular progressive agenda, which is to move us further into our sexual and gender identity and further into the, into the pursuit of expressing ourselves and finding fulfillment sexually and romantically, which is not and never has been part of Christianity. And so it seems to me that, that both in terms of Gaza and in terms of, of inclusivity and the way in which we understand sexual continence, 
The key to the two different ways of Christian understanding is the recognition of the existence of evil. So those who've encountered evil and had to deal with it um, are, are completely convinced, of course, <laughs> that the route the church is taking, both the Anglican churches, which got there slightly earlier, and latterly through the agenda that drives the synod on synodality, the Catholic Church, which is moving in exactly the same direction. And one wants to point out that if only they'd look at what happened to liberal Protestantism, why would they want to continue in that direction? Just purely pragmatically, just weighing up what happens to a church uh, that abandons the traditional understanding of holiness, the traditional boundaries that express purity and a longing for holiness. But that seems to me to be the issue. And it's one of the reasons why conservatives, uh, why conservative Catholics in particular, are so grateful for Our Lady and for the Rosary, because as we confront evil, we know what it smells like, tastes like, feels like. We know its effects. We discover that the Rosary and Our Lady are the most powerful weapons against it. Now, there are theological reasons for that, which I think require explanation in a different way. Uh, different arena uh, and it's and and the prayers to saint michael which pope leo the 13th established uh, in the 1870s and 1880s when he had that dreadful experience of the evil that was to come upon the church again part of dealing with evil so this is not some special pleading to allow dinosaurs or reactionaries or die-hard conservatives to keep their favorite kind of religion it's an explanation that if you look, for example, at the two kinds of football I talked about, one is utterly dull and a little bit pointless and not really football. And the other makes a great deal of sense of everything you know about football playing against an opposition. We in the church are playing against an opposition and we're not playing. It's a matter of life and death. It's a matter of eternal life and death. It's a matter, too, of, of the extent to which hell enters our political affairs uh, as we make our pilgrimage on earth. And perhaps, as we look at liberal, progressive Christianity on the one kind, with its determination to be inclusive and nice and fair and kind, all rather sweet things, but they're not very much, they don't have very much to do with, with the real faith. If you read the Gospels, you see Jesus dealing with evil all the time. If you see the Gospels, you see that Jesus is not concerned, to be fair, thinking, for example, of that parable where he takes the people who sought work in the beginning of the day, in the middle of the day, and the end of the day. And when at the end of the day, they say, but you were not very fair in the way you paid us. He said, I, is it a problem for you if I'm generous? I don't want fairness from Jesus. I don't want justice. I want gratuitous love. And, and I want to, to allow him to help me become sufficiently holy so that I can stand in the nuclear presence of God without being consumed or rejected. And so the biblical, traditional, holy route to God is not the same religion, it seems to me, as the one that's being practiced by the nice, inclusives, inclusive, non-discerning progressives. And perhaps as with growing, gaining an understanding of the, of the dreadful dynamics that have led to the evil in Gaza and Palestine, we might take more seriously the fact that we have an opposition and our role is to counter it with all the tools that Christ and the Church <clears throat> have given to us for that purpose. To God be the glory for ever and ever. Amen. We might end with the prayer of St. Michael. St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in this day of battle. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray, and do thou, O Prince of the Host, cast down into hell Satan and all other evil spirits who prowl through the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. God be with you. <laughs>